Hello everyone, my name is Cosmo Lucasi and I am part of CFA Society Chicago's Distinguished Speaker Series Advisory Group. I want to welcome everyone to our Society's webinar featuring Anthony Scaramucci. Information on upcoming events can be found on the Society's website at cfachicago.org. All mics for attendees will automatically be muted during the event. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature. We will begin the event with remarks from Anthony. R.J. Nesevich, CFA, co-chair of the advisory group, will then join us to moderate questions from attendees. Anthony Scaramucci is the founder and co-managing partner of Skybridge Capital, an asset management firm with over $9 billion in hedge fund assets. In 2011, Anthony received Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year from New York Award in the financial services category. In 2016, he was ranked 85th in Words Magazine Top 100 Most Powerful People in Global Finance. Anthony sits on various boards, including serving as Vice Chair of the Kennedy Center Corporate Fund Board. From his childhood, running paper routes in working class Long Island to Harvard Law, Goldman, Skybridge, and politics, one of Anthony's hallmarks has been his resilience in dealing and eventually prevailing in the face of adversity. Today, Anthony will share with us his ideas on how to make your portfolio resilient in light of the uncertainty brought upon us by the current election season. I will now turn it over to our speaker, Anthony Scaramucci. Wow, thank you. That was like a great introduction. I, I mean, I'm sure my mom wrote that for you and you read it exactly the way she she wrote it. So I appreciate you doing it that way. Um, I, I thought I would do, if this is okay, I would talk for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. I don't want to talk for a half hour because I think that's a little bit too boring on a Zoom call. Uh, talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then take questions and as I told everybody at the CFA Sh Chicago Society, there's no question for me that's off limits. I don't, I don't know the difference between on the record and off the record anyway, so it wouldn't really matter. I'm just going to tell you what I think one way or the other. But um, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about is the delta in our overall businesses and just my observation being on Wall Street for 32 years, less my 11-day fiasco in Washington, which I'm also happy to talk about. Uh, but in the 32 years I've been on Wall Street, we've had probably eight or nine crises, depending on how you want to measure them. Uh, it would go back to the 87 crash. Some people may remember the UAL merger talks that broke up in uh, October of 89. And then we rolled into the Gulf War. And then we had the David Askin crisis, where the mortgage backed market melted down in 94, where the Federal Reserve uh, under Alan Green spans stewardship 26 years ago was raising rates. Uh, 200 basis points in uh, two months uh, and caused the mortgage market to seize up. And then we rolled into 1998, where we had the long-term capital management crisis, the dot-com bubble busting in March of 2000, 9-11, obviously uh, what we thought was a huge crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008. And then it turns out that the global financial crisis was actually a dress rehearsal uh, for the COVID-19 crisis. And so uh, in quick summary, uh, having been through similar movies before, uh, it being my ninth, eighth or ninth crisis, um, I have three sort of aphorisms that I've developed that I always share with my people at Skybridge and our clients. And I think it's super worthwhile uh, for people that uh, have a CFA. Uh, the first thing is whether we like it or not, we are unbelievably emotional about our money. Uh, Morgan Hassel, who just wrote a book called The Psychology of Money. It came out in September. He's a close friend of mine. I would encourage you to either read the book or go to salttalks.org, where I interviewed Morgan about three or four weeks ago. And I thought, you know, his book was arguably among the best books that I have read on how we think about money, whether we like it or not. Money represents for most of us uh, an artistic expression of our lives or for running a university endowment, or we have assets under management. It's a reflection of our work performance. It's, it's a reflection of our output, no matter how you look at it. And so if someone is destroying that, if you give somebody a dollar and they take it down 20%, it's almost a personal affront 
uh, and we get emotionally charged with it. And, and Morgan's uh, uh, supposition in the book is that basically the best among us, and this is super hard, but the best among us try to detach ourselves from the money and try to look at the situation objectively. Sometimes in our business, money managers get punished by their investors uh, due to poor performance. And so what ends up happening is the uh, market drops or the fixed income market goes down, the NAV goes down, people get happy feet and they run. Uh, some of it's born from fear that they're gonna lose even more money. And some of it is born from punishment. Uh, but really the, the best way to sell somebody out, if you will, is through the irrational, through the rational action as opposed to the irrational action of actually really assessing what they own. And so uh, aphorism number two, which I think is apropos and Buffett always talks about this, is that the markets are actually a weighing machine over long periods of time, uh, but there may be a voting machine in the short periods of time where people are running away from certain assets. And so for Skybridge, uh, we've had a very tough year. Uh, our, our March performance was arguably the worst uh, that we've had since I started in the industry. We were down about 24%. Um, I will say this to you that I had the uh, portfolio positioned uh, with a 3.5% unemployment number in mind, 2-ish to 2.4% growth in GDP, and a fourth year of a presidential election cycle, which usually a lot of gravy is put into the markets through stimulus and things like that to try to help the incumbent. And so we were sitting there uh, with a bond surrogate strategy in our fund of funds, and we were shooting for a sort of a 7 to 9% return, uh, and we were primarily concentrated in the structured credit space uh, for that. If somebody said to me, okay, well, uh, what are scenarios that could uh, hurt your portfolio? One of them would have been uh, the U.S. unemployment rate is minus 3.5%. And in a blink of an eye, eight short weeks later, it's going to go to 14.7. Now, of course, I wouldn't have believed that. Uh, but then you would say, well, what if there's a global pandemic? We haven't had one of those since 1918. Uh, but what if there's a global pandemic? And then I, I will say this to you, and this is my third aphorism. When you are wrong about something, uh, be the type of person where you can admit that. Uh, because if you can admit that you're wrong about something, you can then, as a classic entrepreneur or a very good money manager, you can adapt and pivot. If you can't admit that you're wrong or you can't face the music about yourself or whatever your shortcoming is, uh, then you can continue to dig a hole for yourself or double and triple down in a situation which could make things worse. And so uh, I'm going to set the scene for you. It was January 20th, 2020. I was at the World Economic Forum. Uh, I was with several hedge fund managers and a few uh, active money managers sitting in a meeting with two representatives from the World Health Organization and an epidemiological expert, an epidemiologist that was talking about the COVID-19 situation. Again, January 20th, the first case in the United States, January 21st. We're sitting in the meeting. There's several uh, super well-known managers. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you the end of the story right now. So every manager that was in that meeting had a horrific month, month of March. Why is that? Uh, well, we got confirmed biases from each other and from the health organization, the World Health Organization and the epidemiologists that the COVID-19 crisis was going to be contained in China. Uh, this was going to be similar to SARS and MERS. It wasn't going to be the movie starring Gwyneth Paltrow and Matthew Damon known as contagion. It wasn't gonna have any of those aspects to it. And so we walked out of that meeting uh, and I was overconfident that we weren't going to have the situation that ultimately unfolded. Now, what we didn't know at that time, and again, I'm just being observational. I'm not, I don't wanna make this political. Hopefully when we get to the questions, if people have political questions, I'll offer my commentary. I'll still try to be objective. But just being observational, the Chinese government let 250,000 people travel out of the Wuhan province uh, over that 90-day period of time. Many of those people ended up in northern Italy, and you could do the contract tracing. Uh, the northern I Italy tourists that ended up on the northeastern seaboard of the United States, primarily in New York, caused a very large amount of the infection in Boston, Hartford, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C., uh, had we had known that at the time, maybe we would have adjusted our portfolio 
Uh, but I'm man enough to tell you, honestly, we probably wouldn't have because we were not fully ready for that crisis. Uh, and so I'll say two more things, adjustments that we made at Skybridge. So the first thing that we did uh, is we had to assess the world uh, pre-COVID-19 and post-COVID-19. 20% uh, of our sec uh, securities, 20% of our investments were in uh, Trump securities, uh, which are basically trust preferreds from community banks around the United States. Uh, these preferreds were issued prior to the last crisis. They have very high yields, uh, but they're basically tied to the balance sheets of community banks. In a robust environment, a robust economy, you can get six, seven, eight percent returns from these things, plus some principal appreciation as these banks use their balance sheets to buy back these preferreds. And so uh, they're great instruments in a growing, healthy, stable economy. They're not the best instruments in a post-COVID-19 economy because the community banks, uh, they put strip centers, uh, you know, retail strip centers, uh, shopping malls, suburban commercial office buildings on their balance sheets. All of that stuff is struggling right now. And so we had to make a ruthless decision in the month of August to shed those assets, uh, probably sold seven or $800 million of those positions, unfortunately at distress prices. But the good news for Skybridge, we were able to roll into places like Canyon and Third Point who have done very well since uh, April 1. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish up uh, my, my business commentary uh, by saying a few things. Number one, when you get something wrong, you got to admit it to yourself. Uh, number two, you got to mark yourself, obviously, to the market immediately and then assess the landscape with the world that you're living in today. Uh, you can't go back to the world that we were living in. Uh, the post-COVID world, uh, it could have been different for the United States. We could have figured out if we didn't politicize the science and we didn't politicize and have a 50 uh, state strategy as opposed to a unified national strategy, we probably could have curtailed the deaths. Uh, just give you these numbers. Uh, you have 20% of the per capita deaths going on in Germany, uh, in a place like South Korea, uh, which got the virus same day that we did, January 21st, 2020. In South Korea, you've got 20 deaths per million. We are just over 600 deaths per million. Case counts are now clicking back through uh, 65 to 70,000, 700 plus people a day are dying. And, and by the way, that that's a big mortality number because we know a lot more about the virus today than we did six months ago. Uh, so it just gives you a sense for the magnitude of the calamity that's going on in the country and the fear that it's caused and the deconsumption effects that it's caused around the country. So, so for me, uh, we've made the adjustment. Uh, I'm happy to report uh, that since April 1st, I think our portfolio is up a little over 15% and Skybridge is on the mend. And of course, uh, us having a lot of retail investors, uh, going back to what Morgan Housel would say about the psychology of money, our performance stunk. We stunk up the place. And so people immediately started redeeming. We had our largest redemption period uh, in the month of July. Uh, but pursuant to our 15-year legacy, we met every redemption without any gates or any suspensions. I'm, I'm a very big believer that you have to uh, never hold people hostage uh, in your fund. To the extent that they want their money back, we try to give it to them immediately. Of course, we've had a 15-year track record of doing that. Uh, last thing, and I'm going to switch over to politics if that's okay, and then I'm going to take questions. I would just say that uh, for me, uh, things that work in our industry are putting the culture ahead of everything else. And I don't, I don't want to sound cliche about that, uh, but you can tell right away a good management team uh, uh, when they're not gun waivers. And so what do I mean by gun waivers? Uh, you're at the OK Corral. You've got your six shooters. All hell is breaking loose and you draw. Are you a gun waiver where you're, you can't hit the target? Or you somebody like Michael Jordan, when you pull the, the pistol out, you can fire with pinpoint accuracy uh, through the commotion. Uh, and the only way to do that, frankly, is to train yourself constantly to think in the exact opposite direction of your emotions. Uh, and hopefully everybody on this call, this Zoom call, has done that uh, for themselves and their clients in this environment. Uh, but it's been a rough environment. Um, and I would say that... Uh, of all things that I'm worried about on a future basis is we have a very top heavy recovery 
that's primarily stock market related. There's probably 15 or 16 names that are doing quite well. And those valuations look sort of ridiculous. And the bottom, the S&P 250, most of those names are down anywhere from 8 to 12% on the year. Uh, the S&P 485 doesn't look that, that great either. Uh, and it just tells you that there will be another forceful correction in the market. It's not saying the markets are going to go down, but there could be a very significant rotation in the markets as other sectors start to do better when the economy improves. Okay, so I want to talk two minutes about the politics, and then I'll take any question. Uh, as it relates to politics, man, I got to tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes in my, my life, but uh, being in politics has got to be at the top of the list. It's got to be the Mount Everest for me. Uh, and I just, uh, not that you guys really care about this, but I'm going to share this story with you. I joined Goldman Sachs. I'm in the private client wealth area. I'm supposed to attract wealthy individuals and families and small endowments to the firm's investment management prowess. Uh, but I don't know anybody. I'm, I'm coming out of Harvard Law School. There's supposedly an old boys network. But in 1989, at the age of 25, I'm a young boy, if you will, in an old boys network. I don't know anybody. I grew up in this blue collar neighborhood, so I never hit a, a tennis ball or swung a golf club. Uh, never been inside a country club unless I was a guest of, of one of my, my pals in college. And so I'm sitting there at, at, at Goldman Sachs, vexed about how I'm going to build my network. And so what do I do? Uh, I say, okay, I'm going to write a check into the political theater uh, and let's see if they do these fundraisers and maybe there's networking clatches or cocktail hours that I can go visit. So the first person I write a check to is Rudolph Giuliani, uh, 1989. I give him a $250 check. I'm 25 years old. I go to a cocktail party. Uh, he loses the election. Uh, and then him and I become personal friends. We've known each other for 30 years. And frankly, I choose to remember the mayor the way he was back then, not sort of the shenanigans that he's doing today. But, but there I was, and he helped me expand my network. And I ultimately was the garden variety Republican fundraiser over the next three decades. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the accidental presidency of Donald Trump. And again, I'm sure there's a lot of people on this call. So I'm sure there's Trump supporters on the call and there's Trump detractors on the call. Uh, and maybe there, maybe you're the same person. Maybe you're a detractor of his and a supporter of his at the same time. You can't figure out what to do. You've got two weeks to go prior to the election. Uh, but here's what I would say to everybody on this call. I think all of us would probably agree on this. He's a non-conventional politician. And so uh, a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed Jeb Bush for a salt talk. Uh, I was working for Jeb Bush before I moved over uh, to then candidate Trump. And I said, you SOB. I said, if you'd only won the primaries, if you'd only have been the candidate, even if you didn't win, uh, there was no chance I would have gone through that fiasco that I went through inside the White House and my firing and my return to Skybridge. And so I'm going to say this about uh, that part of my life, and then I'm going to take questions. Number one, stay out of politics. Okay, I would roundly recommend that. I can't wait for this election to be over so I can uh, get myopically uh, more focused on my business. Number two, uh, talking about making mistakes. For me, uh, one of the biggest mistakes I made when I was in the White House uh, is I got my pride and ego involved in my decision making. And so you guys are money managers, you're CFAs. You can't do that ever. You can't do that in your marriage. You can't do that in your personal life. You can't do that in politics. And you certainly can't do that in money management. But let me just say this about myself. When I got my pride and ego involved in my decision making, my emotions went up and my intelligence went down and I started making really foolish and really stupid decisions. So it's a cautionary tale for everybody uh, when you think about politics and you think about what you're doing with your life and how you see yourself. Okay, so with that, I appreciate being here. I think Jeremy's gonna curate some of these questions and you can ask me any question that you want. We can talk politics, the economic outlook. We can talk about the global trade situation. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, I, I have a very strong commitment to the American military. I've been uh, to some of our war zones like Afghanistan and Iraq. I, can, I have a very good understanding of where we are going to be over the next 15 years as it relates to our military footprint irrespective of who the next president is. Uh, and so with that, I'll take any question. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, hi, Anthony. It's RJ. Can you hear me okay? 
Yes, perfectly. Argued. Great. You know what? There are quite a few. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Great presentation. Um, we have quite a few questions queued up, but just on my own personal, if you could elaborate on just what you said, we'll start off the, the 15 years of like military thoughts and kind of your experience there, that would be a really interesting start. And then we can kind of go on to some of the Q and A questions from our attendees. Okay, well, there, there are two books on my desk I'm going to recommend to everybody, okay? And I'm, I, I'm in the process of interviewing both these people for Salt Talk. So the first book is Fareed Zakaria's book. It's a shorter book, but it's 10 Lessons for a Post-Pandemic World. And he's just talking about how the world is shaping up. We'll address that in a second. Uh, this is a very close personal friend of mine. I met him in Iraq. Uh, his name is H.R. McMaster. He was the president's national security advisor. He just wrote a book called Battlegrounds. Uh, HR and I know each other for 10 years. Just a quick, funny story. I joined the White House on July 21st. HR super excited. I go into the National Securities Office in the West Wing. I'm so happy that you're here. We're going to so much to do together to get ready. Oh, by the way, I live over at Fort McNair because I'm still a, a three-star general. I'd love to have a barbecue to welcome you to the West Wing, and it'll be overlooking the Thomas Jefferson Memorial. What do you say? We'll invite all of our buddies I said, okay, that's great. He says, okay, he calls his wife. He says, how's August 1st? I said, okay, well, well, August 1st would be terrific. Well, it turns out, RJ, I got fired on July 31st, okay? And so <laughs> now I'm walking the halls. General Kelly has fired me. Him and I have subsequently become very good friends. So another learning lesson. When you get your ass fired, you know, don't take it personally. See if you can develop a relationship with the person that fired you. And so General Kelly and I are uh, actually more than close friends. We talk uh, almost uh, twice a week. But now I'm in HR's office and he's bummed out that I've been fired, but he's more upset about the beer and the hot dogs and the hamburgers that he's now long, okay, going into August 1st. And so I say to him, well, let's have a farewell from the West Wing party. And so we did on August 1st, sort of bittersweet, I had a farewell from the West Wing. Um, but, but here's what I would say about our military footprint. Uh, it is designed, unfortunately, still off of the template of containment, and it's still designed with a post-World War II construct. As an example, you've got tens of thousands of troops in Germany. Uh, you have them in Subic Bay. You have them in, in Japan. And the footprint was designed to contain the hegemony of Soviet-style communism, a totally different world going on right now. Uh, and we really haven't retorked or refitted uh, to the new world. In addition to that, you've got these hypersonic missiles. Maybe you've seen this, uh, the hypersonic missiles that have been produced in Russia. Uh, the Russians uh, have a $61 billion military budget. Uh, the United States last year was cresting towards 700. Uh, people are smart on this call, so they know that we're probably burying another 100 or so billion in black ops, you have to assume that the Russians are probably burying, you know, 30 to 50 billion in their black ops. Uh, but I just want you to think about this. The Russians control 11 time zones, the largest landmass in the world. They, they cover a good swath of the Eurasian continent, but yet the GDP of Russia is uh, just under the size of Texas and Italy. And so this is a nation that is punching over its weight and it's got its fingers in a lot of different things around the world, uh, trying to upset and destabilize uh, US interests around the world. So, so my prediction is over the next 15 years, things like our standard uh, Navy footprint with aircraft carriers, uh, we're gonna be moving in a different direction. We have a smaller, more nimble Navy. Uh, it's very hard to get those carriers now close to the coastlines. Uh, they became very valuable assets. Uh, 30 years ago when Tom Cruise was storing in Top Gun. Uh, but if you look at these hypersonic missiles that can come off the ground at about nine feet, okay, and they're coming at you like a line drive, uh, you know, laser, uh, you can't get the aircraft carriers as close to the shoreline as you need to, to have them be effective in terms of your offensive procedures in a military strike. So, so uh, a quick, quicker answer, it's just gonna be different. It's gonna be much more nimble we're going to have to make a decision on Taiwan. Are we defending Taiwan? What are the signals there? Uh, our politicians don't think about this stuff the way they used to. Uh, I'll take you back to the 1960 presidential debate. There was a discussion between Richard Nixon and 
John F. Kennedy about Kimoy and Matsu. And if you go look at a map, a Google map, those are two tiny islands off the coast of China. They have to be part of the old Republic of China, affiliated with Taiwan. And there was a discussion 60 years ago that the Chinese, the mainland Chinese may invade those islands. What was the United States going to do? And it's a fascinating discussion between two men that want to be president of the United States. You fast forward to the debates today, uh, we have sort of a very different debating style going on. We have sort of a little bit of a uh, uh, non-substantive thing going on. But we're going to need to answer those questions. And I think we're going to need to have a military prepared to uh, defend those parts of the world. I think the United States still wants to maintain its benevolent democracy status and wants to keep its military advantage over the rest of the world. Wow, excellent answer. That's uh, some pretty fascinating stuff. And um, I appreciate that. Change, switching gears a little bit, um, we have a question on back to kind of Skybridge and, you know, hedge funds, especially equity oriented hedge funds have kind of underperformed over the past several years. Even you could probably say almost 10 years. Do you have any um, kind of insight as to why that is, you know, oversaturation of strategies or passive versus active investing uh, performance of the S&P? Just uh, elaborate that since, you know, the sky bridge is definitely near. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to overstate the obvious, RJ, but I got it down to two words, the Federal Reserve. At, yeah. at the end of the day, you've got the Federal Reserve has adopted for 12 years that we're ra raising rates a little uh, in 17 into 18. But the Federal Reserve is basically, we're in a lock on zero interest rate policy. We did that after the 2008 crisis. We're doing that on steroids now as a result of COVID-19. And so it's going to be hard for standard issue, long, short hedge fund managers to do well in that environment. Moreover, you have very, very low interest rates. So you have to now make a calculation. Everybody here has got an actuarial table in front of them and they're saying, okay, I'm managing money for myself, an endowment, uh, my asset management firm. What am I shooting for? Okay, so I think something realistic to shoot for, if you're also calibrating risk, is five or six percent return. Now, I'm old enough uh, in the industry where, you know, that was below the 10-year treasury when I joined the industry, you know, and, and so we're sitting here with a 10-year treasury at 70 basis points. If I'm shooting for a five or six percent return, I'm trying to get eight to nine times the risk-free rate of return uh, and so therefore, there's going to be some, some exogenous risks on the table. It doesn't sound like a big return, but in this environment, in fact, it is a big return. And so, so I would just say, say to people, uh, there has to be room in your portfolio for hedge funds, because yeah. let's just give an example of the month of September. Uh, our long term, our 10-year track record is great. Our three, five-year track record uh, is uninspiring primarily because of May, uh, March of 2020. Uh, but, but if you look back 10 years, we've actually outperformed the hedge fund industry by 30% net of all fees and expenses. Uh, and I predict that we'll climb our way back there because we're pretty good fundamental investors. And so for me, we're looking for a six, 7% return. I got all my money in there. Uh, my attitude is I told my kids uh, to read a book that I read when I had no money and I was hustling papers as a kid. It was called The Richest Man in Babylon. It was written by George Clayson. Maybe some of you have heard of the book. Uh, there was a knockoff on that book in the 1990s called The Wealthy Barber. Um, but my attitude is I put a little bit of money away every single month. I'm shooting for a 6 to 8% return. At a 7, I can double my money every 10 years. I may not be the richest person in the graveyard, but my family will be roughly financially independent. If I can just stick to that discipline and I can get my clients to stick to that discipline. So to me, even though hedge funds have underperformed and there's a very big debate about passive and active, let's take the month of September, uh, U.S. stock market down 3.8%, NASDAQ down 4.3%. Our fund was up 81 basis points, uh, primarily because we're in alternatives and they should act alternatively. Unfortunately, we made the decision to be heavy on structured credit at a time where a meteor strike to, to uh, US markets, uh, COVID-19, it seemed like the ground zero of that was structured credit. Now, the good news for us is because we're credit analysts and we believe in the long-term cash coming into that portfolio, we're locked and loaded our portfolio. Skybridge's fund right now 
as uh, in this would this would account for Steve Cohen in the fund, at, you know, 0.72, uh, Dan Loeb, Josh Friedman. The aggregate yield on the fund is about 8%. So our carry every month is about 67, 68 basis points. So to me, I would tell people, I got to have some money in that. You know, is it is it 3%, 5%, 8%? Sure, I get net net. Netflix and Facebook and Amazon and Apple, and I understand all that. Uh, but I also know that Amazon has dropped 50%. It went public in uh, 1997. It has had a drop of 50% in its price six times since it went public. It is the greatest stock ever. And if you were smart enough and tough enough to hold on when it was dropping 50% all of those times, God bless you. But if you look at the chart and you look at the volume, Typically, what happens is the opposite is happening. You know, you're selling at the bottom and you're and you're buying at the top. So I would just tell people a sturdy, diversified asset allocation strategy is sort of the third little piggy house. That's the brick house of the three houses, and and that's where I've tried to live for my career. Outstanding. It's very good I advice. Big, I have a big mouth as a television pundit. I have a big mouth in politics, but I'm actually a very boring investor. <laughs> Most of the stuff that we own is in fixed income. Understood. Understood. Um, and you mentioned a few of the individuals and funds that are in your fund. Can you talk about the vetting process a little bit when you are looking to bring and or remove, uh, mostly bring in funds if you're doing the vetting process, um, when you're looking to add um, an individual or a group to, uh, to Skybridge? So if you, if you, if this is available online now, you could, you could Google the little book of hedge funds. The PDF is online. I put the Skybridge questionnaire at the back of that book. I wrote the book in 2012. We've added to the questionnaire a little, uh, but it's basically on the framework that everybody is guilty until Skybridge proves them innocent. And so unlike a court of law, uh, I'm assuming everybody's going to take my money and they've got nefarious activity and they're like the book Bad Blood or the Billion Dollar Whale when they're coming through the door. And so uh, we're really looking for long-term oriented managers that have survived a few crises. Uh, we can really only be 10% of that manager, so they have to be reasonably scaled. Uh, and everybody is guilty until we prove them innocent. So we do a very rigorous uh, qualitative and quantitative assessment, obviously background checks on all the senior management. We have to have a direct feed from the prime broker in terms of uh, seeing what's in the positions and the sizings and you make sure everything matches up. Um, that's how you avoid the Bernie Madoff situations or uh, some of the other situations that have, ar 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 have arisen in terms of fraud in our industry. Um, uh, but I think the number one thing for me is what Simon Cal would call the X factor. And, and that is I can assess pretty quickly if somebody's willing to chew through broken glass to keep themselves, their employees, and their family in business. And so uh, my worst year wasn't even 2020. It was 2008. If you were with me uh, in 2008, we were down 19%. Uh, I was on my knees in December of 2008. I had people coming to me saying, you know, you should shut the firm down. Skybridge is no bridge. It's blown up bridge. The bridge to nowhere. Uh, a lot of gallows humor at Skybridge in that moment. Uh, and, you know, I told people to scram, you know, we, we invented the salt conference, uh, in the early part of 2009, we bought Citibank's fund of funds and we recalibrated and we grew the firm and we adapted and pivoted. And so I need to be with people that think like that, where failure isn't an option. They are what I would call boat burners. Uh, you know, go back to the early colonists, uh, the captain, uh, tells his Lieutenant burn those goddamn boats. Okay, there's no going back. We're on the beach and we're going to make a go of it here in the new world. And so uh, I like investors that do that. I have a very uh, close relationship with Steve Cohen. Uh, some of you may remember this when he was in his strait of trouble in 2011. I was out publicly defending him. Uh, we both own a piece of the Mets. Uh, he's going to own a lot bigger piece of the Mets, uh, uh, hopefully after the World Series, when the owners have a meeting and approve them. But I would say that he's one of the best multi-strats in the world. And so we have a very big exposure to him. Dan Loeb uh, would be another example of that. So I hope that's right. helpful, but that's how we think about it. No, it's excellent. It's excellent. And congrats on the uh, potential uh, Mets there. I didn't realize you had a minority stake. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the thing. Okay. Talk about investing, right? We have CFAs on the call. So I made that investment for all the wrong reasons. Okay. This was very open. So uh, Bernie Madoff had destroyed the Wilpons. Uh, they'll be mad at me for saying it that graphically, but that's sort of what happened. 
They were looking for outside money. I went in with Jim McCann with 1-800 Flowers, Steve Cohen, Bill Maher, the American comedian. Uh, we bought a slug of the team. Uh, and I did it for all of the wrong reasons, okay? So talk about the psychology of money. I did it for vanity, okay? I did it for, wow, I'll get my clients. Uh, I'm a lifelong Met fan. I'm going to sit in the dugout. I mean, all the stupid reasons that you could come up with. That all You mentioned earlier about checking your ego, and yet with Yes, the, exactly. <laughs> well, I, as a... you can see, I've had more than one time in my life where I haven't done that. But, but I, I, I did it for all the wrong reasons. And I did get to hit batting practice at City Field, but but here's the thing: it turned out to be an amazing investment. Okay, and so over that period of time, from 2011 to today, and Steve is is uh, you know well, I can't disclose the terms of the thing, but but needless to say, it's turned out to be an amazing investment. And what I would say to you: why was it an amazing investment? And this is something you need to think about with your stocks and your bonds. If it is a impregnable franchise. Think about it. There's only two major league baseball teams in New York. The Mets are one of them. It's a very large market. They have a huge loyal fan base. I've suffered as a Mets fan for 50 of the 56 years I've been on the planet. And I'm trying to get my sons and even my daughter to suffer alongside of me. But, but the point being is that uh, even though I bought it for the wrong reasons, I bought the right asset. So you always have to think about that when you're investing. Outstanding. Okay. Um, well, switching gears again a little bit, this is heading a little bit more towards politics. We have a question for you um, from one of the attendees. Although polls are showing Biden leading by double digits, what makes you confident that this election is different? Hillary had a similar lead at this stage in 2016. Well, there's a, there's a couple of things that are different. Uh, uh, the, the vice president has a huge money lead. Uh, and what I would say to you is something that H.L. Mencken once said, and I would paraphrase it, when you're looking at a battle, assess the strengths and weaknesses of the opponents and go with the person that has more strength versus weakness. And, and you know, listen, Mr. Trump is once again an underdog, which is surprising because he's the incumbent president. Usually the incumbents have an advantage. Uh, but I would say this is different because Mr. Trump is a proven entity now. He has a three and a half year or four-year track record as president. Uh, people vote emotionally. And I would say one of the emotions coming out of this thing right now, there's been a tremendous amount of disruption in the society. He has a very strong base of people. I would attribute that more to the culture war in the United States that's going on than to anything else. Uh, there are certain conservative media outlets that have decided that it's us versus them. Uh, and Mr. Trump represents the last white man standing to defend our society from the latte drinking hordes of African-American and Hispanic transvestites that are gonna come up over the transom and take over the government and take over their culture. And so, so they, they've got that narrative ginned up uh, eight to 11 o'clock at night. In between that narrative, they're selling uh, catheters and CPAPs and my pillows. And so I don't know, there's 40% of the people in the United States that have accepted that narrative, uh, but I'm pretty confident in the other part of the United States where there's reasonably intelligent people in swing states and reasonably intelligent people who recognize that what is going on right now. And I, I would stipulate that he's made the country weaker and he's made it sicker and he's made it poorer. And I can back that up objectively. So, so people say, oh, well, you're sore at the guy because you got fired by him. That's really not true. I was trying to be loyal to him and the administration, the Republican party for two years after I was fired. And if anybody's heard me speak publicly prior to this conversation, I've always taken full responsibility for my firing. That Nobody was to be blamed for my firing other than myself. I said something stupid, which was ridiculously funny, by the way. And it happened to be, you know, a remark about Steve Bannon. And look how things have unfolded for Steve Bannon. So, you know, I'm pretty good at reading talent. I have a pretty good eye for what people are like. And I would tell you that anybody close to Mr. Trump, anybody that has worked for him, whether it's myself, Kelly, Mattis, Tillerson, McMaster, uh, if you're not tied to him and you're not making money off him or you're not a family member or you've got some kind of political power position that you're trying to preserve, you're giving a pretty objective uh, assessment of what, what he's done. And so, yes, could he still win? Absolutely. I was with Mr. Trump uh, uh, the day after the Access Hollywood tape, the uh, flash polling. He was down 14. But this is different. Uh, he was running against somebody that was polarizing. I happen to like Secretary Clinton personally. But she was polarizing. You could look at the polls. Uh, the polarizing candidate in this election is Mr. Trump. 
Uh, and so uh, Joe Biden, whether you like him or dislike him, there could be a massive swell of voting uh, to vote out Mr. Trump as opposed to voting for Joe Biden. But anything can happen. And I'm not, I'm not one of these people uh, that thinks that we're 10 or 12 points in terms of a spread here. This thing is going to narrow. There'll be more salacious information coming out about both candidates over the next two weeks. This will be a slug fest until the last moment. But I'll make a prediction on this uh, Zoom call. Uh, if Mr. Trump loses, he's leaving. He's not going to be holding up the American system or the democratic process or not acknowledging a peaceful transfer of power after 244 years. Uh, the good news is even if he wanted to do that, which I predict that that's just bluster anyway, he doesn't have the support to do that from the American military. If you want to turn our country's democracy after 244 years into an autocracy, you better get help from the military. And I can tell you flat out, he's one of the most hated uh, commander in chiefs in the modern era. It's not just the retired generals and the active generals that dislike him. Go look at the voting. Most of the, the kids in the military, the enlisted men and women are Republicans, uh, but the vote is decidedly against him for Joe Biden. So, so again, you asked me my opinion. I got to share it. I hope you don't mind. I'm trying to be as objective as possible. He could win, but if he does, uh, and if you're voting for him based on business and you think he's better for the economy, uh, I would tell you that he's threatening our system and he's threatening the institutions of our democracy. He's sort of perverting them. Uh, and another four years of this stuff would be quite damaging to us. And I would take that a priori, the integrity of the system, the institutions of our democracy, the checks and balances of power at the top. Uh, I can speak for myself, not for the people on this call, but I know that the diffusion of power at the top of our government has allowed for all of us to be free. Uh, the great Roman philosopher Cicero said 2,200 years ago uh, that we, he, was, he was remarking about the Republic of Rome before it turned into a dictatorship under Caesar. And he said that we are slaves to the law. Each of us are subordinate under the law in order to be free. Uh, and so the integrity of the system is way more important to me uh, than the individuality of the policy. And so for me, that's why I've been so vocal about this. Understood. All right, that's fantastic. Um, second, another question here. Um, given what you heard in Davos, curious about your thoughts on one, the New York Times article that the administration officials knew about the threat of COVID, um, like Larry Kudlow on, for CNBC, uh, for example, uh, versus what they were saying publicly. Well, listen, I don't, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, so I don't want to be overly aggressive. I like Larry personally. Uh, I think those are two great reporters. Kate Kelly is somebody I work with at CNBC when she was there prior to moving over to the New York Times. Uh, she is a objective, uh, she has OCD in terms of fact checking. So in terms of the accuracy of the reporting, uh, was the headline a little out there? I sort of agree with Secretary Mnuchin that the headline was probably a little out there. The New York Times has been triggered by the president. They had to issue an apology to him after the last election. So they've got to probably at the editorial level take some of their emotion out of it. I read the article uh, this morning. And I would say there's probably elements of truth there. Um, and it's disturbing to me about the presidential tweeting. I would, I would, I would ask you to look at Bill Cohen, C-O-H-A-N, he writes for the Vanity Fair. Uh, it's a disturbing confluence of trading activity around the president's tweeting, whether it's the most recent tweeting about the stimulus or the markets tank, and then they rise back up because he's talking about putting on a stimulus, taking off a stimulus or the tariffs uh, going back into the summer of 2019. And so there's some disconcerting things that are going on and it doesn't smell right. And so, so I can't speak to the accuracy of it, but if you're asking me gun to my head, does this smell right to me? Is the story accurate or inaccurate? I feel like it's more accurate than inaccurate. And I think it's very disturbing. And I think this is the reason why the Trump administration is gonna be voted out because people like with their money, we started with the psychology of money People vote on their emotion. I'd like to tell you that this is a hiring decision for the American people. It is not. It is oftentimes just a popularity contest. And I think we have somebody beaming into our living rooms every single day that most of us are by and large exhausted by. And we sort of would like uh, uh, the, the next political leader to go into the back pages as opposed to the front pages every single day 
ad nauseum. And so this story doesn't smell right. I don't think it helps them uh, with two and a half ish weeks to go in the elect uh, up up to the election. No, I would agree with you there for sure. Um, another question, just if you could elaborate a little bit, um, investment strategy under a Biden Harris administration, any changes that you may or may not make, uh, and your thought process on that? So, you know, I, I'm the contrarian here. Now, some of you will say, well, he's talking his book because he's, he's endorsed president of uh, vice president Biden. I, I will just take you back to the 2008, nine situation, uh, the Obama administration taking over for the Bush administration. Uh, what did they do? They maintained many of the elements of the policy. Number one, the Federal Reserve policy unchanged. Will the Federal Reserve policy be the same or different in January of 2021? I maintain it'll be unchanged. Number two, uh, the automobile policies and the TARP situation were transferred over to the Obama administration. They made Tim Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury, he had wa worked with Paulson and he had worked with uh, Chairman Bernanke. So so that was unchanged. And I really do believe those same things will happen in a Joe Biden administration. I'm close to Gene Sperling, who's advising them. I'm very close to Larry Summers. He was on my advisory board for a period of time. We're good friends. Uh, and so I think that you're going to have a great continuity of an economic policy. And for those of you that are worried about your taxes going up, I can only, again, point back to the 2009, 2008 time period uh, Barack Obama, President Obama, he could not raise taxes. The economy was just too anemic. There's too much fragility in the economy right now. Like it or not, we need wealthy people at the top end of the consumption cycle to start that engine again, if you will, that virtuous cycle of consumption. So, so I don't see any real changes. And so therefore, gun to my head, uh, the Biden administration and the Trump administration will probably be roughly even uh, for the markets. That's my honest opinion. Uh, if you go to Moody's or J.P. Morgan or Goldman, I've read all three of those reports. They're suggesting that the Biden administration, because of the bottom heavy stimulus, stimulus going to middle and lower middle income people will be quite robust. That that could be, that could, could trigger or further accelerate growth. And they're talking about an additional, in the case of Moody's, they're talking about an additional 7.6 million jobs. That, that could happen. That could be positive. I want to be more neutral than that. And I, I sort of think it's a toss up. Okay. Okay. Um, understood. Um, I have a question here. The election day being right. You don't have any like mean tweeting questions or anything like that. No, I mean, so no. far everything I'm seeing, I, mean, I, I was hoping that I would be, you know, like yelled at or no one's trying to throw an I mean, tomato at me through the, you have to remember who you're speaking to. Typically those of us with our CFA designation tend to be kind of more like, I guess, chill. Um, okay. I'm looking All for right. something that's like really, all right, so let me take my, can you hold on a second? I'm going to take my athletic supporter off then. I, I thought I was, you know, I, I left the helmet in, in the closet, but I, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Um, what's your opinion on recent Hunter email scandal impact on the presidential election? What should we position our portfolio? So, you know, listen, we were talking a little bit about this in the green room before we opened up the discussion, everybody. Uh, I thought Twitter mishandled that because uh, if you look at the, facts of the situation, they are quite cloudy and there's some circumspect facts, a result of which it requires more fact checking and Twitter and Facebook don't want to be caught in the situation that they were in in 2016 related to what the Russians were doing in terms of social media activity. And they may have overreacted in terms of the way they edited or censored that. And I think that played into President Trump's hands, frankly, because if he's starting a narrative with his base that big tech is in the tank for Biden and Harris, well, you know, you've got some prima facie evidence. It appears that way, even though I don't think that's necessarily true, uh, particularly on the case of Facebook and the relationship that President Trump has with Mark Zuckerberg. But on the case itself, let's assume that every single thing is true. Uh, you then have to ask yourself, okay, we're in a pretty stinky political environment. Uh, is it therefore fair to balance out that equation and look at Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump making $36 million this year, $81 million last year in direct violation of the Emoluments Clause while in the White House? Uh, it, are those cancelable? Is one more nefarious than the other? You know, I'm not, I'm not going to you know, opine on that, but what I am going to say is that we're in a very, very nasty business. It's very nefarious. And Hunter Biden should definitely not be president of the United States. I think that this, this sort of information, if it's 100% true, it's disqualifying of him. Uh, and I think as it relates to voters, 
uh, good or bad news, I think the sediment is almost like concrete right now. There's very few undecided voters. And so we're going to have to have a bigger explosion than the one that's uh, playing out in the New York Post right now. Uh, but on the margin, it did help President Trump because it's emboldening his base. And what the president needs, if he's going to pull this inside straight again, if he's going to fool the pollsters and win re-election, he's got to dig very, very deep into his base. He has to find white, uneducated Americans that didn't vote in 2016. He's got to get them registered. He's got to pull them over to the polling booths uh, to get him to maintain his, uh, his office. And so on the margin, could that help him? I think it does, but I don't think it's going to have a significant impact on the election. Apparently, there are more bombs to drop on both sides. And so I'm just wondering if they cancel each other out. Okay, understood. Um, you touched on this briefly. Um, it was, um, sorry, just my, <laughs> I have one here, actually. This is a little bit different. The original question was about China, but I'll get back to that. Um, do you have issues on Joe Biden's cognitive issues? So, you know, listen, again, you know, Mr. Trump is uh, mispronouncing Burisma last night. He's out of step. He's got arguably some brain fog from COVID-19. He's 75. The vice president's 78. Um, have these guys slowed down a little bit as they've gotten older? They probably have. I'm not an ageist where I'm going to start throwing rocks and, and stones at these guys. I have a 93-year-old uh, uh, uncle who was in the war as sharp as a tack. So I would say no, because I have met with the vice president and I have spent time with him and I have been in Zoom calls with him and I've been in strategy sessions with him where he seems very clear and he seems very cogent. Uh, are you going to catch somebody at 78 uh, saying things that are regrettable or saying he's running for the Senate when he's running for the presidency? Of course, you're going to do that the same way you're finding the same stuff on the other side. So, uh, no, I don't see him, uh, uh, see, he's, he's not senile. There's no, no evidence of that to me. I'm not a neurologist, but there's no evidence of that to me. But he is 78. I mean, let's face facts. And, uh, the, uh, and yeah, you have to ask yourself a rhetorical question. You know, are we going to have any young leaders, maybe post baby boomer leaders that are going to be more transformative than the current crop of leaders? Okay. Um, and back to, I mentioned the China um, question, and again, you touched on this, but do you see China's um, increased presence on the global stage as a meaningful and increasing threat to U.S. economic and political power? Or are there mitigating factors that will hinder their pursuit of global clout? Well, there's certainly mitigating factors, but I think that you have to recognize that China is uh, on the rise. And somebody's asking in the chat room about the book that I put, held up. It's 10 Lessons for the Post-Pandemic World by Fareed Zakari. He actually addresses that question in the book, but I'm going to recommend a different book if you guys don't mind. It was written by the dean of the Kennedy School of Government, uh, and uh, it's called Destined for War. Uh, the gentleman's name is Graham Allison. He is a uh, brilliant guy, uh, and what he says in the book is there's a Thucydides trap, the great Greek historian who wrote about the Peloponnesian War. And so if you remember what happened on the Greek uh, peninsula, Sparta was the superpower. Athens had become a democracy. It started to rise and become prosperous. It threatened the existing power structure. Sparta went to war with Athens. They thought the war was going to last four or five months. It turned out to be a 30 years war, and it ultimately destroyed both of those Greek civilizations. And so what uh, Dean Allison says in this book is that you've had six, 16 episodic events where a rising superpower is threatening the existing superpower. Uh, in those 16 times, 12 of those times we've gone to war. Uh, in a case, uh, you know, in the early part of the last century, the 20th century, uh, Great Britain was in decline, the United Kingdom was in decline, and America was on the rise. And what he writes in the book, uh, that was acceptable because they were kissing cousins, they had the same roughly religion, the same rule of law, the same sort of culture. So there wasn't the war that sometimes happens, but the United States and China are very different ideologically, different party systems, one's two party, one's one party, and you've got this struggle going on inside of China. People that really understand China know that it's seven provinces that are fairly balkanized, by the way, that are held together by a very hegemonic uh, one party system. 
Um, what do we know about one party systems? We know one party systems have a life expectancy of about 70 years. You can go to the Mexican one party system. You could go to the Russian one party system, 1917 to 1991. You could go to the Japan one party system after the second world war, the Philippines recently in Malaysia, the one party system crumbled. And so what happens is when we study one party systems in the modern era, we know they have a life expectancy of 70 years. The Chinese now are in overtime because they just celebrated the 70th anniversary since the revolution. Now, the bad news is the United States is a republic. Republics have a life expectancy of about 200 years. So we're in overtime as well. We've got to find political leaders in our country that will help the country cheat history and extend the life of the republic. And at the same time, we have to figure out a way to make sure that there's a cohesive bilateral relationship with China. This stuff is super, super complex. You can't just look at the concentration camps that the Chinese have or the trade relationship that they have or the intellectual property theft. You've got to look at the entire system and you have to do a very thorough check and balance analysis of where we need to be with China. And so while I was in agreement with the president on trying to right side the trade situation, I can take everybody back to a meeting. I was on the executive transition team. I can take everybody back to a meeting in December of 2016, where we told the president, well, if you want trade parity, why don't you just increase tariffs 2% a month? You'll get there in two and a half years, uh, 10, 10 quarters of, uh, I'm sorry, 2% a quarter, 10 quarters, you get there in two and a half years. But well, the president doesn't want to do that. He's a showman. Ultimately, the president wants it to be about him. When he does a new search, he's searching T-R-U-M-P. He is not searching USA. And by the way, he is definitely not searching Y-O-U. Okay, you may think he thinks about you, but trust me, he don't care. He is not, he's never searched Y-O-U in his life. Okay, so he's searching T-R-U-M-P. And that strategy was too gradual. It wasn't, too, it wasn't enough muscle flexing and elbow flexing for him. And I think we've caused unnecessary damage to that relationship. And so now we're going to start to silo ourselves off and our supply chains are going to become self-contained. I would argue that's more dangerous for the world longer term. Uh, and so we need to fix that. And I would predict in the Biden administration, we would go back to something like TPP, we'd probably reignite that process. That would have been a very successful check on Chinese power in the Pacific, uh, but it wasn't properly explained to the American people. Okay. Well, thank you, Anthony. That's, um, we're coming up on an hour. Can I give you one more question and we'll call it? Does yeah, that sound no, right? I got time. Uh, yeah, you know, all right, I mean, well, the, the beauty of this is, you know, I, I get to talk. So, you know, I'm Italian. You know, I can talk all day, RJ. <laughs> we get, I got plenty of time. Well, maybe we'll do a couple more. Um, what are your thoughts on ESG investing gaining popularity through the pandemic, political division, social unrest, et cetera, fad or structural change? Well, no, listen, I definitely think it's a, uh, a structural change. I think it's going to be part of our future. And I think that whether we like it or not, something is happening in the environment. I'm not a climate denier. I am a Republican. That is what I would say is a climate realist. And I think we have to face the music. Otherwise, you know, we're in a frat party situation where we're wrecking the frat house and then we're gonna want our children and grandchildren to live in the frat house on Saturday, uh, on Sunday morning. I don't want that for my kids. So we have to figure that out. So yeah, I'm a, uh, Skybridge doesn't do it, but I am a proponent of it. And I think it is a part of the future long-term. Okay. Um, do you see the negative leadership traits of Trump um, gaining a stronger hold in the private sector? Some of the deflecting responsibility or, mm -hmm. you know, some of the bullying threatening action. Do you see that kind of spilling over to the private sector or is that not, uh, not necessarily on your radar? Well, you know, I would say no to that. I would say that it could be happening a little bit, but I, I think that uh, you've got corporate boards that would hand check that. And so I would just submit this to everybody on this call. Imagine that we were on a corporate board, publicly traded company, we were part of the search committee and we selected Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton to be the CEO of our publicly traded entity. How long could he have lasted uh, with the behavior and the antics that he's presenting himself with. And so the answer is not very long. We would be seeking our outside counsel would be running in to the boardroom saying, you have to get him out of here immediately. So, so I, I, I don't, I don't think so, but I do, I, I think you're saying something different though, which it has infected. There's a bellicosity to our culture. 
you know, I'm, I, I get lit up with death threats. I get lit up with uh, uh, anger-based emails all the time. And we've lost sort of the decorum and civility to be disagreeing with each other while being agreeable. And I think we've lost some of that. I would also say that if Mr. Trump loses, you have a very good part of the population that is supporting him that feels disconnected from the system. They feel like the system has left them behind. They're prone to sue these conspiracy theories because of that. They're prone to, you know, it's working for the other guy and the man, but it's not working for me. And as I've said to the Biden administration, I've said to my fellow Republicans, we have to fix that. Uh, you know, Mr. Trump saw it. He identified it. Uh, they galvanized around him. He ultimately became the avatar of their anger, but he never really provided any policy solutions to help them. And so we have to fix that because we have to, we have to fix that have the wealth gap converge a little bit. And we Do you have, have any thoughts on how to fix that, Anthony? Well, there's many, there's many thoughts. You know, look, I grew up in an aspirational blue collar family because my dad was an hourly worker, but he made enough money where we could live in the middle class. That very same job is down 26% in real economic terms. So you go from aspirational to desperational. So the first thing is you need sort of a program, national program in coordination with the states of equal opportunity. I'm a Republican, so I'm always gonna be about uneven outcomes. I'm always gonna be about the benefits and the rewards of risk-taking and uncapping outcomes. I want the Jeff Bezoses to be in our society. But the flip side is uh, none of us picked our destination of birth or our skin color. Uh, and so depending on where you're born, you're, you're getting a good K through 12 public school education if you're born in certain zip codes versus others. And so we have to right-size that. We're smart enough now. We have enough technology. Look at these Zoom calls. We could bring the best and brightest teachers into the poorest areas. We can figure this out. We're smart enough. And so we need to re-engineer the K through 12 educational system. We need more jobs training. We need more infrastructure spending. There's a way to do that off the balance sheet of the federal government. We could get a private public partnership together. We could build an infrastructure bank that funds that the way Fannie and Freddie operate on the housing market. Uh, there's a, so many different things that we could do. But here's the thing I would say to everybody rhetorically, where is the 10, 20, or 30-year plan for America from our politicians? And the answer is there is none. They're beating each other's brains out on cable news in two-minute news cycles, and they're not focusing on the future like the Chinese. Even the Saudis have a 30-year plan. McKinsey wrote it for them, but they have one. We don't have one. Yeah, and we certainly need one. I agree with you there. Um, I do have a question just have you always more personal? Have you always been politically active or did this kind of stem no. from? No, this has been like a disaster. I come on guys. I was in, in 2016, I was hosting wall street week. I had the salt commerce had a very nice business and I was the garden variety Republican party fundraiser. You know, I got tempted, uh, you know, and this is again, what I said about my pride and ego, I got tempted to go work in the administration. You know, I thought, okay, I'm going to go work for the American president, grew up in a blue collar family. Uh, you know, my wife told me not to do it. She she probably hates Trump almost as much as Melania hates him. I mean, she probably doesn't hate him as much as Melania, but she's got to be up there. She told me not to do it. And I didn't listen to her. <laughs> gotcha. So, I mean, here we are. But I mean, here's the problem. Now I'm like the Michael Corleone of politics. I'm in. So I'm not getting out until we can fix this, you know. And so I have, you know, it's hurt me. It's hurt my business. Uh, my opinions have, uh, I've been punished. Think about the psychology of money. Someone hears my opinion, they don't like it, they'll redeem their money from me or they won't invest with us. But I'm okay with that. All right, fair enough. Um, and there's one question here, and it's um, simply, you know, you seem like an avid reader. Do you have a book or two that you would give to a, a college student right now? Well, certainly Graham Allison's book, Destined for War, is a great book that I would give to a college student. Um, Richard Haas, H-A-A-S-S. -S. He just wrote a book called The World. Uh, and I would recommend every college student. That is a great graduation book. It's a 300 pages. And he's basically taking you from the post-World War II architecture. He spins the world and he gives you some content on each continent and some things that we need to consider as Americans uh, in terms of what our foreign policy should be. Uh, and I would tell you that uh, we're lacking some of that in our educational process right now. It's become way more technical. So I would recommend that book for sure. Okay, great. And then one last question, Anthony. Um, 
and this goes back to the economy a little bit, what do you think of the long-term impact of def deficit spending and zero inter interest rate policy will be and your outlook, outlook and positioning for the next 12 months? So I would encourage everybody, now we're talking about books, you can see I'm a, I'm a book lover, but I, I would encourage everybody to read The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kilton. She is considered the founding mother, if you will, of the modern monetary theory. Uh, Stephanie's a professor out here on Long Island at Stony Brook University. And whether you like it or not, we're going to print a lot more money. Uh, she's making the case in the book that it's not going to have that big of an impact on us. If you are a Milton Friedman economist or more classically trained economist, you believe that it will. But I would encourage you to read that book because I think it'll force you outside of your conventional thinking. Uh, ultimately, the United States, because it is still the currency reserve, uh, we've got some laxity, we've got some latitude. Moreover, the U.S. government owns 28% of the land in the country. You can Google that. That's a factual number. Uh, underneath that land is probably $60 trillion of minerals and natural resources. So if you've got a $25 trillion debt and you've got something on your balance sheet that's worth 60 and you have the taxing power of the United States with a $22, 23000000000000 trillion economy, I wouldn't be overly worried about the deficit right now. That's the shortest answer I could give you, but I would encourage you to read, read her book. All right. That's a great answer. And honestly, a great talk, great presentation. We cannot thank you enough for coming, Anthony. Well, no, it's um, a pleasure to be on. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. It's always a lot more fun. I know. Than, uh, Hopefully someday we'll get back to that sooner than later, uh, right? Thank you. And uh, I appreciate being on, RJ. Thank you, guys. And I wish you guys great health and uh, great personal safety. Thank you very Thank much, you. Anthony. And right, if guys, you have any well. questions uh, to our, atten our get attendees. Get out and vote. That... Even if you don't agree with me, get out and vote. we got to get people voting. That's right. right. We bless. absolutely do. It's very Thank important. Well. Um, any questions about today's event, please contact CFA Society Chicago um, at info at CFA Society Chicago.org. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Take care.